Hello everyone and welcome to video tutorial 18. You should now know all about the nervous system and hormones and you should be able to pause the video and answer the questions. So you need to try to label the parts of the reflex arc of the word bank below and explain why a hormone only works on its target cell. So pause the video and try to answer the questions before I go over the answers. So the answers are that A would be your receptors, B would be your sensory neuron, C would be your inner neuron, D would be your motor neuron and E would be your defector. And the answer to it, the hormone has a complementary shape to the receptor of the target tissue. So you needed to make sure you mentioned that the hormone had a complementary shape to the receptor of the target tissue. So if you managed to get that all correct, well done. You can move on. If you didn't, then you'll need to go watch the other videos again. Today we're going to look at reproduction in animals, which is part of key area B. If you want the worksheets to go with this video, remember to pause the video and go to two multicellular, three reproductions, two consumables and activities. And then the PowerPoint is found in PowerPoint and is called 3.1 Reproduction in Animals. So today we're going to be learning about reproduction in animals. Our learning intention is to know the structure of gametes and the sites of their production in animals. Be able to compare and contrast the male and female animal gametes. Describe the cells are diploid except gametes which are haploid and explain that fertilization is the fusion of the nuclei of two haploid gametes to produce a diploid zygote and know the difference between sexual and asexual reproduction. So to be successful you will be able to compare and contrast the male and female animal gametes, state whether cells are diploid or haploid and be able to describe what it means, write a sentence to explain what fertilization is and state the difference between asexual and sexual reproduction. From your previous knowledge in cell biology, you should be able to fill in the blanks. So pause the video and try to fill in the blanks before I go over the answers. So the nucleus contains structures known as chromosomes, and these are made up of DNA. Our DNA is two meters long, so it needs to be wrapped so it can fit into that tiny nucleus. Chromosomes carry genetic information needed for normal cell functioning and for cell division. And short sections of chromosomes that code for one protein molecule are called genes. So if you don't know that, you'll need to go watch the DNA and the cell division videos. So DNA is a chemical inside the nuclei of the cell. It controls everything about us. It controls our eye colour, our personalities, you name it. DNA controls it. DNA is arranged into 46 chromosomes, which is 23 pairs, and we should know that from cell division. But where do we get this DNA from? We get half of the DNA from our mum and we get half of the DNA from our dad. So, DNA is wrapped in these things called chromosomes. The chromosomes are thread like structures found inside the nucleus of the cells. Each chromosome carries hundreds of genes and each gene encodes for proteins that are necessary for the developing of the cell and the survival of the living organism. We learned about chromosome complement in cell division. The number of chromosomes in a cell is called the chromosome complement. In humans, this is 46 chromosomes. We also learned in cell division that sex cells, also known as gametes, had half the number of chromosomes, so only 23 chromosomes in this case. So there is a karyotype of chromosomes, which just means our chromosomes are arranged in a diagram over here, if you can remember that from cell division 2. So the number of chromosomes in a cell is called the chromosome complement and it's different for different organisms. So in humans this is for In multicellular animals and plants, normal body cells which are also known as somatic cells are diploid and sex cells which are also known as gametes are haploid. Remember we learned about diploid and haploid in cell division. So we would now write a note on diploid versus haploid cells and we would need to learn this note because it's what you need to know. So diploid cells are body cells which are also known as somatic cells and diploid cells means that they have two sets of chromosomes, di meaning two, so di, two sets of chromosomes. Haploid cells are different, they are gametes and they're also known as sex cells so it would be your sperm and your egg. And they have only one set of chromosomes, so half meaning half. And then it's got, but what about the red blood cell? That is the one exception. 
So it's not diploid and it's not haploid. And that is because if you can remember, your red blood cell doesn't have a nucleus, so it can't contain any chromosomes. So here is a karyotype for a diploid cell. As you can see here, there are 23 chromosomes making up 46 in total, so that is for human. We need to remember that sex cells gametes only contain one set of chromosomes, they're haploid. So instead of having the two pairs of 20, they only have a single set. So instead of having the two sets, they have one at each position. So they only have 23 chromosomes in total. So one set of chromosomes. Each organism has a different diploid chromosome complement. So it's different from a human. So obviously we went over ours, which was 46. So what happens to all of these organisms, sex cells or gametes? So in an onion, it's got 16 in its diploid normal body cells. What would it have in its gametes? It would be eight, because obviously it would be half the number that it's got there. What about the other ones? Try to pause the video and work them out before I go over the answers. So the answers would be that the lettuce would have nine in its sex cells and gametes. The bee would have four in its sex cells or gametes. The frog would have 12 and so would the wheat in its sex cells and gametes. The cat would have 19 in its sex cells and gametes and the horse would have 33. And then we already know that a human would have 23. So well done if you managed to get that correct. Usually in class, we would make a bar chart just to practice of the different chromosome complement for the different species. But before we learn about that, we're going to try to work out the average chromosome complement. So pause the video and try to work out the average yourself before I go over the answer. So firstly, to get an average, we need to find total. So that means adding all of the numbers together. So 18, add 38, add 48, add 78, add 24 add 46 add 64 which equals 316 so once we've got our total which is 316 we need to then divide it by the number of groups we've got so we have one two three four five six and seven so 316 divided by seven which gives us 45.1 something something so we're going to round that so it's 45 so 45 would be our average on this case so now in class we would practice drawing a bar chart so firstly we need to decide what is on the x-axis and what is on the y-axis this is easy with a bar chart because the words which would be this column here always go on the x axis and the numbers which are this column here always go on the y axis the next thing that we need to have a look at is what the headings are so this heading is species and this is chromosome complement we always take the headings and put them directly on the axis label what we are going to do and we also need to work out what the smallest number is and the biggest number and the biggest number on this occasion is 78 so we need to find an even scale that will go up to 78 and we always do this by coins. So we start off with our 1p, our 2p, our 5p, our 10p and so forth. So let's do our bar chart. We need to label our axes first. So we've got a species which was one of the table headings and the other table heading chromosome complement. Now we need to work out an even scale so it needs to go up evenly. So we start off with our 1p, see if we can go up in ones, but that won't give us enough room. Then we do our 2p, then our 5p, then our 10p, then our 20p, then our 50p and 100p and so forth. Right, and we have decided that we can go up in tens, so we need to make sure that it's even. Then we will put all of the species at the bottom and then we will draw our bars. We do not shade in our bars because we don't want to accidentally go over the top like I have just done because that will lose a mark. This is the line that we get to look at. It needs to be exactly on the number. So for example, the first one is 18, so it needs to be exactly on 18. If it goes above or below, then you would lose your mark. So well done if you've managed to plot your bar chart correctly. 
Remember the bars need to be even and an even gap left between. So let's now move on to reproduction. Reproduction is the process by which members of a species produces offspring. Without reproduction, species would go extinct. There would be no you or I. So there is two types of reproduction. There is asexual reproduction that we should have learned about in third year. So you should already know that asexual reproduction only involves one parent. It produces genetically identical offspring, which are clones to the parent. So they're the exact same as they are brothers and sisters and their parent. There is no variation between offspring and parents. So if one of them gets a disease, then the other one will get a disease too. And it is a very quick process. Whereas sexual reproduction, again, you should have went over this in S3. It involves two parents. So you get 50% from your mum and 50% from the dad. And your parents give you a new genetic combination. This process produces variation. So there is variation and the offspring are not genetically identical to their parents or to any siblings that they have. We're going to look at sexual reproduction in more detail. So you need to be able to label a diagram of the reproductive organs. So we're going to look at the male reproductive organs first. You should be able to label the diagram and pause the video because you should have done it on third year. So try to label the diagram yourself before I go over the answers. So the answers are A would be your penis and the tube here would be your urethra. Then we have B is our bladder, which is where urine is stored. C is your sperm duct, which allows the sperm to move from where it's produced to the urethra. And D is the testes. So where are sperm produced? Sperm are produced in this thing here called the testes, and that is a part that you need to remember. So sperm is produced in the testes. And we didn't go through the role of the penis, but that is obviously to go into the vagina when sexual reproduction happens. So let's look now at the female reproductive organs. Again, you should have done this in third year, so you should know all of the different labels. So A would be your uterus, which is where your baby is held when it's getting made. B is your oviduct, which is the site of fertilization. C is your ovaries, which produces your eggs. And D is the vagina, where the penis is inserted during sexual reproduction. So it asks at the bottom where are your eggs produced, and we should already know that the eggs are produced in the ovaries. And that is an important thing to know and remember. So we need to know about where gametes are produced in mammals. Gametes just mean in sex cells. So the testes are the site of sperm production. So that's where your male gametes are produced. And the ovaries are the site of egg production. So that is where your female gametes are produced. And you need to know that. And the ovary is circled at the bottom of the diagram. And so is the testes. In class, we would now make a note that in animals, the male's haploid sex cell, also known as the gamete, is called sperm. And the sperm is produced in the sex organs called the testes, which are also known as gonads. We need to be able to say how the sperm cell is specialised. So the sperm cell is specialised because it has a nucleus containing a haploid number of chromosomes, which allows it to fuse with the egg at fertilisation to form a diploid zygote. The sperm cell also has a tail which allows it to swim to the egg so that it can complete its function of fertilization. And the sperm cell contains lots of mitochondria so that it can produce lots of ATP, allowing it to have lots of energy to swim to the egg for fertilization. And the sperm are so small that you would get about 450 million of them on a teaspoon. So we need to know sperm cells are haploid, they are produced by the testes. The sperm cells are your gametes, your sex cells. They have a nucleus containing a haploid number of chromosomes. They have a tail that allows them to move. And they have many mitochondria for energy to allow that, that sperm cell to swim to the egg and that tail to contract. So you'd also need to make a note on your female sex cell, which is also known as gamete, which is your egg cell, your ova. And you need to know how this egg cell is specialized. So in females, a haploid sex cell are called egg cells ova. They're also, sex cells are also called gametes. So it's also your female gametes. 
So egg cells are produced in sex organs called ovaries. Again, that's referred to as a gonad. So how are these egg cells specialised? Well, their nucleus contains a haploid number of chromosomes, so it can fuse with the sperm to create a diploid zygote. It's got a jelly coat and it's got a yolk cytoplasm with a large food store to provide food. An egg is the biggest human cell. It's so big that this is how small a sperm looks next to it. This is because the egg contains a food store. So the important thing to know about the specialization of an egg is it contains a large food store and it's got a haploid number of chromosomes. So remember to make a note on your egg cell and on your sperm cell. So from what I've just said, you should now be able to match the beginnings with the endings. So pause the video and try to match each of the beginnings with the endings before I go over the answers. So the answer would be that sperm cells have many mitochondria to provide ATP for movement. The ova egg cells are considerably larger than the sperm cells, as in addition to the nucleus, their cytoplasm contains a food store. Sperms consist of head regions, mainly a nucleus containing genetic material and a tail, and a sperm's tail is, enables it to swim towards the egg. So well done if you managed to get that correct. If not, then go back to the start of the video. Each human has 46 chromosomes, so we get 23 chromosomes from each of our parents, which provides us with a unique set of chromosomes and obviously unique DNA. You now need to learn the definition of fertilisation, so write it out many times, say it over and over until you know it. So the definition of fertilisation is the fusion of the nuclei of two haploid gametes, so that would be the egg and the sperm, to produce a single diploid cell called a zygote, which divides to form an embryo. In humans, this occurs in the oviduct of a female. So fertilization is the fusion of the nuclei of two haploid gametes, which is an egg and a sperm in this case, to produce a single diploid cell called a zygote, which divides to form an embryo. In humans, this occurs in the oviduct of a female. So say over and over, right out over and over, but make sure you know that. You should now be able to pause the video and answer the three questions. Try to do it before I go over the answers with you. So the three questions are, what is fertilization, what are gametes, and explain why a gamete is always haploid. So the answers are, so fertilization is the fusion of two haploid nuclei cells to create a diploid zygote, which divides to form an embryo. Gametes are the sex cells, so egg cells in a female and sperm cells in a male. Gametes are always haploid because a combination of two gametes will produce the correct number of diploid chromosomes in a zygote. So well done if you managed to get all three of them questions correct. If you didn't, then go back to the start of the video. You can pause this video now and go to the link to watch a video on fertilization or you can go back to at uh, the end. But it's a good idea to review your knowledge and watch this video on fertilization. Let's have a look at fertilization in more details. So ovulation is the process by which an egg or an ovium is released from an ovary. So the egg leaves ovary at ovulation and the sperm enters the vagina and swims up towards the uterus, which is stage one. So you can see the egg leaving the ovary and the sperm swimming up. For stage two, the egg or ovum moves along the oviduct. So you can see the egg moving. Then stage three, fertilization. So the cells combine to form a zygote. So the sperm and the egg meet in the oviduct to form a zygote. Then your sperm uses chemicals to dissolve in the jelly coat of the egg and get inside, and that means only one sperm can get inside. And in stage four, the zygote moves down into the uterus and the cells start to divide and multiply. So there's your zygote moving down. In stage five, the zygote sinks into the uterus lining, obtaining food and oxygen cells is now known as an embryo. So now in class we would stick in the diagram and label the diagram to review our knowledge. So you can try and pause the video and try to label the different stages of what happens at fertilization and ovulation. Right, so firstly, 
In the first stage, the egg is released by the ovary, which is known as ovulation. Then the egg is picked up by the funnel of the oviduct. And then the egg is moved along the oviduct by hair-like cilia. And then the sperm fertilizes the egg in the oviduct. So how does the embryo then develop into a baby? So this link takes you through all of the different stages of pregnancy, but you don't need to know that. That's just if you are interested in it. But let's look briefly at what happens to the embryo. So this is a fertilized egg only 30 hours after conception. It's magnified here and it's no larger than the head of a pin. So it's still rapidly dividing and the developing embryo is called a zygote at this stage and it floats down from the oviduct and towards the uterus, which you already know. So between week three and five, the embryo's main features begin to take form by a process called differentiation. So differentiation produces varied cell types such as blood cells, kidney cells and nerve cells. The embryo's tiny heart begins to beat by day 21. Arms and leg buds are visible and the formation of the eyes, lips and nose has begun. The spinal cord grows faster than the rest of the body, giving a tail-like appearance which disappears as the embryo continues to grow. The placenta begins to provide nourishment for the embryo. So in week 7, our major organs for the embryo have all begun to form. The embryo has developed its own blood type, unique from its mother's. Hair follicles and knees and elbows are visible. Facial features are also observable. The eyes have a retina and lens. The major muscle system is developed and the embryo is able to move. Between week 8 and 12, the embryo is reacted to its environment inside the amniotic sac where it swims and moves. Hands and feet can be seen. At the end of week 8, the embryonic period is over and the fetal stage begins. So between week 13 to 16, the brain is fully developed and the fetus can suck, swallow and make irregular breathing sounds. The fetus can feel pain, fetal skin is almost transparent, muscle tissue is lengthening and bones are becoming harder. Liver and organs produce appropriate fluids, eyebrows and eyelashes appear and the fetus makes active movements including kicks and even somersaults. During week 13 to 20, the baby can swallow and start to try breathing. It can feel pain and moves around a lot. It has eyebrows and eyelashes now. During weeks 20 to 24, a protective waxy substance called vernix covers the skin. By birth, most of the vernix will be gone, but any that is left is quickly absorbed. Fetus has a hand and footprints and fingerprints are forming. Fetus practices breathing by inhaling amniotic fluid into its developing lungs. During weeks 25 to 32, the baby's eyes open and close and it sleeps 90% of the time. Weeks 25 to 28, rapid brain development occurs during this period and the nervous system is able to control some bodily functions. The fetus eyelids now open and close. At week 25, there is a 60% chance of survival if born. Weeks 29 to 32, there is a rapid increase in the amount of body fat the fetus has. Rhythmic breathing occurs, but the lungs are not yet mature. At this point, there is a survival rate above 95% if the baby is born. During weeks 33 to 40, the baby is getting ready to be born. It turns upside down before it is born. And then there is a newborn baby. You should now be able to answer the multicellular biology exam practice questions on page 25, which are your reproduction questions. Now let's try to do some problem solving activities. So pause the video and try to answer all of the questions before I go over the answers. So let's try to work out question one. So sperm move on average 2.5 millimetres per minute if the total journey of the sperm make is 22.5 centimetres from the vagina to the egg cell, how long will the sperm take to reach the egg cell? We know the sperm moves on average 2.5 millimetres per minute. We need to convert the centimetres, um, the millimetres to centimetres, so everything is in the correct unit. So 2.5 divided by 10 to make it centimetres is going to give you 0 0.25 centimetres. And we know that the distance was 22.5 centimetres. So then we would need to divide the distance by how fast the sperm was moving. So that would be 0 0.25 centimetres. So, so 
So 22.5 divided by our 0 0.25, which then gives us our 90 minutes. Right, now let's look at the next question. So a sperm cell is roughly 5 micrometres across. An egg cell is roughly 225 micrometres across. How many times bigger is an egg cell than a sperm cell? So to get how many times something is bigger, you would need to divide the smallest number by the biggest number. So we would need to divide 225 micrometres Divide that by 5 micrometers, which gives us 45. So it's 45 times bigger. Then it says a healthy male aged 20 will produce 10 centimeters cubed of semen. A healthy male aged 40 will produce only 6 centimeters cubed of semen. What is the percentage decrease in semen production? So we know for a percentage decrease, we need to find out the difference first. So we need to do 10 take away 6, which would give us 4 centimetres cubed as our difference. And then we need to put that and divide that by the thing that it was at the start. So the starting number was 10 on this occasion. So divide it by 10, which equals 0 0.4. And then to make it a percentage, we need to times it by 100, which will give us 40%. So there was a 40% is decreased. Right, the last question, an average male will produce 5,000 sperm a second, of which 250 will be healthy. Express this as a simple whole number ratio. So we need to put this into our ratio format. So we have 250 healthy out of our 5,000, so we do dot dots for ratios. So an easy way to do this is to get rid of the zeros first, and then we need to divide it by the smallest number. So we could have just divided it by 250, but we'll just divide it by 25 to make it easier just now. So that would give us a ratio of 1 to 20. So well done if you managed to get them all correct. If not, then watch the video as many times until you get the answers correct. So we've got 90 minutes, 45, 40% and 1 to 20. So we have now come to the end of the lesson. You should now be able to know the structure of the gametes and the site of their production in animals. So you've got your sperm which has a tail and it's got a haploid number of chromosomes. And you've got your egg, which has a large food storage and large cytoplasm. And it also has a haploid number of chromosomes. The site of production of the sperm was the testes and the site of production of the egg was the ovary. You need to be able to compare and contrast the female and the male animal gametes. And you need to describe that cells are diploid except gametes, which are haploid. Remember, gametes are your sex cells. And explain that fertilization is the fusion of the nuclei of two haploid gametes to produce a diploid zygote, which then divides into an embryo. Well done if you can confidently answer all of the success out criteria and outcomes. If you can't, then you need to watch the video again. This is the end of this video tutorial. Woohoo! Thank you for listening.